Welcome to Feminist Question Time, brought to you by Women's Declaration International, the leading global organisation defending women's sex-based rights against the threats posed by gender identity ideology. There's more information on the website womensdeclaration.com, where you will find our Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights, which has been signed by 34,245 people from 160 countries and is supported by 473 organisations. We have over 100 volunteer activists, including 53 country contacts engaged in defending women's rights. Uh, do join us as a volunteer if you can. Today, for our webinar, we have Vicky Lax from the UK, and she's been coordinating and promoting uh, Primark actions, so a campaign highlighting the problem with Primark not having single-sex changing rooms. Then we're going to have Heli from the Netherlands, who's going to give us an update on what's happening in terms of gender identity ideology in the Netherlands. Then we're going to hear from Sue Lent from Wales, who will describe the Welsh government's capture by gender ideology and the work of women to change this. And then our final speaker will be Jill Raymond from the UK, who's going to give a report and tell us about a meeting that happened just recently in the UK Parliament with UK parliamentarians about lesbian rights. Um, and mentioning the, the Women's Declaration International points about um, lesbian rights. Without further ado, I am very happy to introduce our first speaker, that is uh, Vicky Lax. And um, thank you so much. You came on about a couple of months ago and I, um, I, I participated in one of your actions, went to our local Primark and we, we did that, which was really fantastic, great uh, thing to do. I really enjoyed it and hopefully did a little bit. So um, thanks for giving us an update and over to you. In 2015, um, Primark effectively introduced mixed sex changing rooms. They made the decision that transgender um, customers could use the changing room of their choice. Um, they went fully gender neutral in 2019, um, following which from some, you know, fairly basic analysis I've done, there was an exponential increase in um, men's sexual violence against women and girls in those changing rooms. Um, I, I use a lot of the work that Suzanne Black has been doing um, over the last few years. So again, as many of you know, following um, a very tearful TikTok video in September of last year, following um, an incident involving men harassing a young woman in the Cambridge Primark, they did something of what's described as a U-turn, um, which is, wasn't a U-turn at all, where they introduced a what they called women only fitting room space. But you know, we need to be really, really clear Primark's definition of woman is based on gender identity. So a man who says he's a woman will have access to um, the women only changing rooms. Primark say that their staff are trained to be able to stop any individual, also known as a man, um, who they believe is abusing that policy from accessing that female space. What they won't do is they won't actually share any information on how their poor staff, mainly female, let's be fair, are able to tell by looking at an individual um, who is and who is not a predatory man wanting to gain access to a female space. And ever did it feel more relevant than this week with yet another terrible um, issue that is going on for our sisters in Scotland. So what we know is there have been well-documented instances of men's sexual violence in Primark stores dating back to 2007. Some take place, as we know, it's fairly common. Re retail outlets, particularly supermarkets, are um, real hotspots 
uh, particularly for upskirting and voyeurism. Um, we know that it's really well documented, um, certainly since voyeurism and, well, since upskirting became a criminal offence, you know, there's, there's a lot of evidence that's coming out via the, the CPS on this. So we know that there are instances that, that, you know, that have been going on. So since Primark made this apparent change um, for their female-only space, we are aware that there have been further incidents. The most recent was on the shop floor. Um, it was as a young woman or a, or a girl, she was 16, uh, was, was apparently leaving the store. Um, a man has been arrested and charged with sexual assault. Um, I'm not a legal expert, but I understand that he was remanded um, and that there is possibly some, some relevance in, in that, but it's not something I'm too familiar with. And then on the 17th of December, a, a father tweeted at Primark that his daughter had been getting changed in Primark, was spied on, came out into the fitting room to find a man um, basically indecently exposing himself. He was ejected from the store. And then the poor young woman basically found the same fella in the changing rooms at H&M, who also have um, mixed sex changing rooms. I think one of the things that's really concerning, and I mean, all of this is concerning, is that women and girls are still thinking that women mean single sex and it doesn't. I wrote to um, the board and uh, the senior leadership team of Primark on the 25th of November, a day after I actually met with them, to flag to them that three 12-year-old girls had used what they thought was a single-sex fitting room in the East Kilbride um, store, and actually it was mixed sex. Um, so there were some very worried mothers who had contacted me um, Primark and ABF haven't even acknowledged that. You might have, for those of you that are on Twitter, we were tweeting an update yesterday that two months on in East Kilbride, it's the same store, it's the same sign. So women and girls are still using what they believe to be single sex changing rooms, because understandably for many women and girls, when they see women, they think woman, they don't think a man who calls himself a woman. Um, I think some of the other things that we're seeing and from the meeting I had with Primark is they are absolutely adamant that they are not going to step back from this at the moment. So they're basically putting in, they are more robust curtains. Um, I've, I've, I've actually seen them um, and they are putting in boards at the bottom of the fitting rooms. Um, they can't put them at the top because of fire eggs, um, and they think that that's um, OK. They seem to have no um, recognition that for many women, it just won't be enough um, for them to be enticed back into what is still a mixed sex space. So we had a fairly candid exchange of views when I met the Primark team at my local store back in November. What I also did in November, um, ably supported by, um, or December rather, fabulously supported by some of the women from um, Locals for Women, was I am a shareholder in Associated British Food, so I had the fun of going to their AGM. Um, I sat in the front row, uh, and I have to say, as an introvert, I was, well, it was really hard. I'm not very good at, um, at, at being in spaces with lots of other people. But I asked my questions, I raised my concerns, and I was astounded when uh, the CEO of Associated British Foods, George Weston, and his family are the majority shareholder in Primark, they might have an interest in corporate structure, basically sat there and said in this room that one of the advantages of unisex changing rooms was shorter queues. And wasn't it marvellous that he could uh, now get changed with his wife or not get changed with his wife, but go in with his wife rather than sitting outside when they were out for a shopping trip. And I, I guess as I sit here, I reflect on, you know, how the women and the girls who are sexually assaulted and spied on in Primark changing rooms felt about that and whether he would be quite so privileged if he were to say that um, to them. It was quite astonishing. I also asked Associated British Foods via their chairman for a further meeting. I actually wanted to arrange 
for any or, or for them to hear from women who were self-excluding from Primark for, the, for whether it's religious reasons, whether it's for reasons such as mine that I just want privacy and a space away from men, or whether it's women who um, have been subjected to men's sexual violence and they declined that meeting. They weren't interested in hearing our voices because their solution, um, they feel, is uh, to put in slightly better curtains and that that will um, deal with it all. So again, um, you can imagine what my view on that was. Um, so I guess action, what we're, what we're doing, there's, there's a number of things here. So the action that we're looking for, we, we know that in the UK, um, you know, this is, this is all telling you what you know, this is the long haul, we know, um, you know, there's, I think there's probably either going to need to be legislation or, and God forbid this happens, a really serious incident um, that leads to change because they're not going to do it willingly. Um, so I guess what I'm interested in doing, and I do quite a lot of work around this that's not on Twitter, be really interested to gather information about the other locations that Primark trade in that I've, I've noted here. They have really big expansion plans um, this year. They are not going online. Um, George Weston has come out fairly heavily again to confirm that. So this is a high street retailer. They're bricks and mortar. That's their, that's their gig. That's their model. So if anybody is interested in gathering some information on what's going on in the country that you might be in, where Primark are, that would be fantastic. My email address and Twitter are at the bottom. So we'd really like to understand what's going on overseas. Um, the other thing, if, if anybody is interested, um, and I, I guess I would say this, is we there is an action for anybody if you're interested in this. There's all sorts of communication we can have with Primark. We will be taking some more coordinated action. So if any woman is interested in, um, you know, joining and being a part of that then again you know please do get in touch with me um, what I would say for some actions um, where we've got groups set up we are needing and we are vetting women so please don't be offended um, when we do that the reason that we do that is um, again telling you what you know you know, we're getting we're getting told people hope we die. We're getting death wishes um, all because we want men to stop sexually assaulting women when they go out shopping. Um, it is crazy. So it is about keeping women safe. So please don't be offended um, if if for an action you might want to join. We just ask you to be just to go through a little bit of vetting with us. Um, we just want to keep everybody safe. But there is something for everybody to do if you would like to be involved. Um, and I hope it's all right just while I've got this time just to say this. When I started this, um, I was just really angry and I realised I was waiting for somebody else to try to make the change that I wanted to do. So I do me. I'm, I'm own, for a lot of this. I'm me on Twitter having um, a middle aged woman rant. But what I have found and I wanted just to acknowledge this is the support and the solidarity of other women when I've asked for help. And that's women like Joe and Bernadette at WDI. Every time I ask, can I talk? amazing unstinting support it's joanna at northern rad femme and northern rad femme who bring their skills and support and sisterhood to this it's locals um, for women who again brilliant group of women who just step up and help and we're all interested lots of other like-minded women and also very much as i've said before suzanne black who's been um, documenting what's been going on in Primark for ages. So this is a real effort of like-minded women coming together. It's not a it's not a group. You don't have to be in a group, but if you want to join and um, raise your voice, even if it's anonymously with a mask on, that's absolutely fine. But thank you very much. Brilliant. So we're now going to go to Sue Lent, and she's from Wales. Uh, she's a Cardiff County Councillor, member of Merchid Cymru, Welsh Organisation of Gender Critical Women, and also of Labour Women's Declaration Working Group. 
she sings with um you're gonna have to say this um sue how do you say the name of your socialist campaign in choir sorry i didn't realize you're gonna read it out yeah it's good i didn't try right a socialist campaign in choir and used this experience to set up another one Wiffen the women's choir, who sang at Philia, the recent conference that was in Cardiff. Uh, one of uh, Sue's proudest achievements is she was one of the original women who walked from Cardiff to Greenham Common, Common with a one-year-old baby in 1981. And she's going to talk to us now about the situation in Wales. Uh, so thank you so much, Sue. It's lovely to have you. And um, uh, over to you. Um, well, Jock and Val, Joe, thank you very much. Um, I think it's very timely. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak about the situation in Wales. And I think it's very timely given the actions of the Scottish Government in passing the Gender Reform Bill, which would bring in self-ID for 16 year olds, and the response of the UK Government in deciding to use Section 35 of the Scotland Act 1998 to block the bill. Prior to the passing of the Scottish Bill, the Scottish Government obtained a judgment against the gender critical group for women in Scotland which ruled that a GRC grants a change of sex under the Equality Act, and that was the Lady Haldane judgment. So there is a conflict between the Scottish Bill and the Equality Act 2010, as it's always been understood. The Equality Act contains single sex based exceptions, which mean that trans identifying males with or without a GRC can be excluded from women's spaces, for example, prisons, changing rooms and refuges. So the Scottish Bill is very dangerous for women and children, and a threat to their sex-based protections. So to turn to Wales, <clears throat> Wales, like Scotland, is one of the countries making up the United Kingdom. It's had devolution since 1999, and although the original vote for devolution was incredibly close, I think it's fair to say that generally the Welsh Senate has, has popular support, and a vote to increase its powers was passed a few years ago. So Wales still sends MPs to the UK Parliament, but also elects members to the Senate. <clears throat> Wales is a small country, only 3.136 million people in 2019. So it has the feeling of a large village at times where everybody knows each other's business. I think it's important to say that. Wales has a long Labour tradition. The majority of MPs have always been Labour. Labour currently hold 22 of the 40 parliamentary seats and it has been as high as 34 out of 40 in 1997. Similarly, the Senate has always been, <coughs> excuse me, governed by Labour despite the system of proportional representation. So we have 30 out of the 60 seats. Rodri Morgan was Wales' first minister from 2000 to 2009, and was an incredibly popular and recognisable politician. He coined the phrase clear red water to make clear the fact that UK, that Welsh Labour were to the left of Tony Blair's UK Labour. And this was evidenced, for example, by the refusal to use private finance initiatives and the rejection of academy schools. <clears throat> In Wales, for instance, we've had free prescriptions since 2007 and parking charges at hospitals were abolished in 2008. Wales doesn't have as many powers as Scotland and does not have the power to introduce self-ID for those who identify as trans. However, <clears throat> make no mistake, Labour First Minister Mark Drakeford wants this power and he and his colleagues have consistently stated since July 2020 and possibly earlier that they want the issue of self-ID to be devolved. Indeed, when Mark Drakeford was questioned in the Senate on the 12th of January by Conservative member Lauren Jones as to whether he would rule out similar legislation to the Scottish Bill, he laughed before replying that he would certainly not rule it out. He went on to say, we will seek the powers and if we obtain them, we will put them to work here in Wales and we will put the proposals in front of this Welsh Parliament so that those people seeking gender recognition are able to do so in a way that is not stigmatised and does not involve them having to go through a lengthy medicalised route. He finished by saying, I will say this to be absolutely clear that if anybody obtains a GRC in Scotland and then comes to Wales, that certificate will be recognised here for all the purposes you would expect. So Mark is quite clear on this, although his view is now in conflict with Labour in Westminster, who are likely to form the next UK government. And at this stage, I'd like to just briefly introduce some of the key players in the Welsh government. Jeremy Miles, currently Minister for Education and the Welsh Language, 
and before this he was Council General for Wales. He's a gay man but not sympathetic to women's sex-based rights. Hannah Blethyn is Deputy Minister for Social Partnership. She's a lesbian and former chair of LGBT Labour. Again, unfortunately, not sympathetic to women's sex-based rights. Then we have Jane Hutt, Minister for Social Justice. She's been a Senate member since 1999 and has held several cabinet roles, including social services, education and finance. And then there's Julie Morgan, widow of the late Rodri Morgan. She's Deputy Minister for Social Services and has responsibility for a huge area, including social care, children's services, adoption and fostering, safeguarding, autism and children's rights. When I was first elected as a councillor on South Morgan Council in 1989, Mark Drakeford, Jane Hutt and Julie Morgan were already councillors on the same authority. The number of women in the Labour group was tiny, I think it was seven out of 40 something. Jane and Julie had set up the Women's Committee, which had brought women of all cultures together and had organised grassroots meetings with women and fairs and information sessions. Julie was responsible for obtaining the first women-only swimming sessions in Cardiff, which Muslim women asked for. Jane and Julie were passionate about women's rights and representation and women's rights to work, including setting up childcare provision, summer place schemes for council employees and after school clubs in the 90s. Jane in particular was very well known in feminist circles, having been a founder member of women's aid and local abortion campaigns. A councillor since 1981, she spoke at the start of the Women's March from Cardiff to Greenham Common in 1981 and took part in the Women's Peace March from Cardiff to Broadly in 1982. I first met Julie in my first social work post in the late 70s and she quickly became a close friend and mentor. She became a councillor in my ward in 1985 and encouraged me to stand for election in 89. So we've been through many political campaigns together. So I have to say that all of these senior Welsh politicians are completely and utterly captured by gender ideology. But the capture of Jane Hutt and Julie Morgan is particularly shocking and shows the power of gender ideology. These are women in their 70s, now completely at odds with all the women who have campaigned with them since the 70s. I'd like now to turn to the gender critical movement in Wales. Many of us woke up to what was happening to women's sex-based rights and the harmful effects of gender ideology in late 2017. Through word of mouth and social media, a loose group of us, many of whom were active in the Labour Party, formed in Cardiff. And this happened in, in other areas across South Wales. We supported each other and started to have meetings and pub nights. We helped organise the Women's Place UK meeting in Cardiff in April 2018. And through this meeting, we attracted more supporters. We eventually gave ourselves a name, Clashia America Cymru, which is Welsh Women's Voices so that we could write to whoever would listen to us. And we discussed education and what was happening in schools. In July 2018, a group of us had a meeting with Jane Hutt and Julie Morgan. We hoped that if we had a chance to explain to them what was happening, they would be as alarmed as we were. Sadly, this did not happen, and we were met with uncomprehending looks and a feeling that they were uncomfortable and couldn't wait to end the meeting. Since that meeting, there have been numerous individual approaches to Julie, Jane and Mark, all of whose constituencies are local to Cardiff, but without success. In Julie's case, I regularly text articles to her, write letters and speak to her. But while she assures me she reads everything, she says she has reached a different conclusion. Worryingly, despite me texting the Hillary Cass interim review of gender identity services to Julie several months ago and giving her a hard copy in September, when I met with her earlier this month, she still hadn't read it. As women in Wales, many of us campaigned against self-ID during the UK government consultation in late 2018. We leafleted and spoke to people on the streets and at school gates and met with a very favourable response to our concerns. We addressed statues of women across South and West Wales in early 2019. Welsh women took part in leafleting sessions outside the 2018 and 19 UK Labour conferences and following these in late 2019 we launched, launched the Labour Women's Declaration with 300 founding signatories. Those of us in Wales became Labour Women's Declaration Cymru and we now have supporters in at least 22 of the 40 Welsh constituencies. We use the declaration to lobby Welsh Labour politicians and members wherever and whenever we can. 
We try to make ourselves visible and we give out leaflets outside the Welsh Labour events, conferences, etc. In late 2020, Clyshire Merced Cymru relaunched itself with a new name, Merced Cymru, an organisation with a hard-working small executive who put in an enormous amount of work, making us visible on social media and publishing responses to UK government consultations and to those the Welsh Government has launched, particularly its LGBTQ plus action plan and its RSE curriculum, which is relationships and sexuality. In September 2021, Merced Cymru organised a rally of the Senate, Senate to protest the Senate's LGBTQ plus action plan. We formed subgroups to carry out particular tasks. For example, all local authorities in Wales were contacted about their equality policies, and we successfully corrected those who failed to list sex amongst the protected characteristics. Merced Cymru contacted all, con all candidates in the Senate 2021 elections, asking them whether they supported the single sex exceptions in the Equality Act. So gender critical women are active in Wales. And in addition to Merced Cymru and Labour Women's Declaration Cymru, we also have women active in Women's Rights Network, LGB Alliance Cymru and Lesbian Labour. Many of us helped to organise and run Philia in Cardiff last October of 2022. It's well known that the consultation which the UK government held in 2018 concerning self-ID was not their first. Their first consultation had left out women's groups and the second remedied this omission. When it became apparent through articles in the press that the UK government had dropped plans to introduce self-ID, the Welsh government's response was swift. Jeremy Miles and Jane Hutt put out a statement accusing the UK government of, quote, failing in its commitment to formally respond to the GRA consultation by repeatedly delaying publication of the review and expressing disappointment that there had been leaks of selected sections of the report without proper communication by the UK to Welsh ministers. The statement said, this has caused significant stress and anxiety amongst trans people and wider LGBTQ plus communities here in Wales and the UK. We believe trans women are women, trans men are men, and non-binary identities are valid we restate our support for trans people's right to self-identification. We have provided funding to Stonewall Cymru to begin work engaging stakeholders to develop an updated transgender action plan for Wales. This became the LGBTQ plus plan. At a constructive meeting this week, we heard directly from members of the trans community who expressed their concerns about the lack of progress by the UK government regarding its commitment to GRA reform. So this July 2020 statement is very significant and it makes it very clear where the Welsh Government stands and is a real slap in the face for all those women who responded to the UK-wide consultation. The Welsh Government has complete faith in Stonewall and hasn't caught, caught up even now with the fact that many public bodies and private companies are now dissociating themselves from Stonewall. Two phrases that we hear so often in this debate are expert panel and good practice usually used to justify what the Welsh Government is doing and which is anything but expert or good. So the expert panel, which was set up to develop the LGBTQ plus plan, was chaired by a well-known woman, Lou Thomas, who has frequently singled out gender critical women on social media and labelled them TERFs and transphobes. The membership of the expert panel was entirely made up of trans rights activists, some of whom were well known for harassing and intimidating women. So to turn to the LGBTQ plus plan itself, which is put out in the names of Mark Drakeford, Hannah Blithin and Jane Hutt, I suppose the first thing to say is that in common with so much that comes out of Welsh Government, this plan completely accepts gender ideology as a given. There's no discussion about this or recognising that gender ideology is just that ideology. It's always presented as fact. LGB Alliance Cymru has a 56 page response to the plan and I'll just come with some, some of their concerns. They point out that LGB Alliance Cymru had volunteered to be involved in the preparation of the plan, but that they have been consistently rebuffed and only allowed to participate in this consultation on the plan. They state that the action plan is fundamentally flawed and suggest Welsh Government should withdraw it and start again. They suggest that LGBTQ plus is an unmanageable basis for policy, improving the life outcomes of such a bulging, undefined basket of individual identities cannot be measured and monitored in any meaningful way. Some of the points 
that they make are that throughout this debate, anyone questioning gender ideology has been abused and ignored. We must recognise the differences of opinion, the emerging evidence of harm to women, girls and boys and sex attractive people and the importance of free speech. They say we are opposed to the damaging impacts of unquestioning affirmation. We call for a formal multidisciplinary inquiry into the rapid rise of young people, especially girls, unhappy to grow into adults such as their birth sex, quite possibly as lesbian or gay. So the so-called independent, so-called expert panel definition of affirmative care reads, this refers to the way in which care is provided. Affirmative care models take the child or young person's lead and orientate themselves towards understanding and appreciating their gender experience in a supportive and non-stigmatising environment. This approach aligns with a children's rights approach to care and is endorsed by the American Academy of Pediatricians. So LGB Alliance Cymru points out that the plan and report use contested, ill-defined or undefined language which has no basis in law. They say the term queer is offensive to many lesbians and gay men. In the glossary of the panel we have trans is an umbrella term to refer to people whose gender is not the same as or does not sit comfortably with the sex they were assigned at birth. But in the easy read version of the plan, transgender people are born as one sex but are the other. For example, a person who looks like a man on the outside, but may be a woman on the inside. Their definition of lesbian is, refers to a woman who has a romantic and or sexual orientation towards women. Some non-binary people also identify with this term. The recommendations from the LGBTQ plus expert panel include, we should continue to make representations to, to the to the UK government to reform the GRA in accordance with the principle of self-determination and international best practice and explore action which can be taken within Welsh government powers to make progress in this area. So it's all about self-ID and LGB Alliance Cymru asked the question, what about lesbians who wish to organise a social group? They will experience difficulty for simply maintaining their boundaries. The plan should make it clear that lesbians and gays can organise as they wish. So the LGBTQ plus action plan is unsurprisingly in favour of a ban on conversion therapy for trans people. And Hannah Blurthen is fond of saying you can't have the LGB without the T. Her approach, like many Welsh government ministers, is very simplistic. And there are some very suspect statistics in the recommendations of the expert panel which inform the plan. So they say 6% of women have experienced domestic violence in the past year, but 19% of trans and non-binary people and that 46% of trans people have had thoughts of taking their own lives. So it kind of downgrades women as, you know, not as oppressed, I suppose, as trans and non-binary people. On the 21st of June, 2020, Hannah Bleden made an oral statement in the Senate, Pride and Progress on the LGBTQ plus action plan. And here are some snippets from this statement. We are enabling more inclusive education with Welsh Government providing national guidance for schools by the end of the year to help them fully support transgender pupils. This is being done as part of the whole school approach to relationships and sexuality education. And I'll say something about, this, about schools in the last section of what I have to say today. Hannah Blurthin also said, 40 years ago, gay people were subject to hateful slurs and prejudiced attacks. Trans people today are being subjected to a similar barrage of hate fuel to rage. Extending rights for one group does not mean eroding rights for another. We do not believe improving rights for trans women will damage rights for cisgender women and girls. So she's learnt nothing, and like so many of the trans rights activists, she denies reality and thinks that if you just keep asserting there's no conflict of rights, it will make it true. She also confirmed we will seek to devolve additional power to improve lives and protect transgender people. She refers to <coughs> LGBTQ plus rights as being, quote, a key component of the cooperation agreement with Plaid Cymru. Plaid Cymru is Wales's nationalist party and is equivalent to the Scottish NC SNP in its aims. At this stage, I'd like to just talk about the other political parties at the Senate and at UK government level. Plaid Cymru definitely has members and supporters who are gender critical, but at parliamentary and Senate level, there's no one speaking out in support of women. Plaid Cymru member Helen Mary Jones was back in the Senate from 2018 to 21 and was known to be gender critical, having chaired the Women's Place UK Cardiff meeting in April 2018. However, she was placed second rather than first on the regional list. 
in 2021 and so lost her seat. This was undoubtedly because of her gender critical views and she had suffered shaming and humiliation from the Clyde leader, Adam Price, who had forced her at one point to put out a statement of apology in which she agreed to undertake training. Adam Price is a gay man who has been applauded in Plaid Cymru for his and his partner's use of surrogacy to have children. We know from Helen Mary that they, there are sympathetic Plaid Cymru Senate members, but it's very unlikely that they will speak out. The political composition of the Senate is Labour 30, Conservative 16, Plaid Cymru 13, and the Lib Dems 1. The only openly gender critical members of the Senate are Conservative Senate members, particularly as already mentioned, Laura Ann Jones, who regularly asks questions of the First Minister. However, it's different to parliamentary level. At this stage, I'd like to introduce the wonderful Tonya Anton Yazi, Labour MP for Gower, which is just west of Swansea in South Wales. Tonya is an ex rugby international player for Wales and has been concerned about what is happening in sport and other areas for a number of years. Many of you will have met her at Philia last October in Cardiff, where she cheered at plenary on women in sport. She works closely with Labour Women's Declaration members and has spoken at our meetings. <coughs> she was one of, <coughs> excuse me, the, of the brave women who spoke out in favour of women's sex based rights in the parliamentary debate earlier this month around the government's use of Section 35 to block the Scotland Gender Reform Bill. Labour MPs Rosie Duffield and Karen Smythe also spoke, and Miriam Cates from the Conservatives. <clears throat> All of these women shouted, were shouted down and heckled by some Labour and SNP MPs. And <clears throat> excuse me, the Labour MP Lloyd Russell Moyles, not content with shouting at Miriam Cates, and accusing her of transphobia, crossed the floor to the Conservative benches that, so that he could sit close to her and glare at her in an astonishing display of misogyny and male intimidation of a woman. As in other countries, and I was interested in what our speaker from Italy had to say on this last week, it's the right-wing party which is advocating for women's sex-based rights, and this is true in Wales at Senate level. However, there are a growing number of female Labour MPs across the UK who are sympathetic. This includes several in South Wales. Some are more public than others, but the numbers are growing. Labour Women's Declaration members have put in a lot of work at parliamentary level, including cross-party work with women in other political parties. We've had openly gender-critical members of the House of Lords for some time, of all parties and independent members as well. The work of these women across the political parties is slowly paying off. Conservative gender critical women have been particularly effective in terms of the number of Conservative MPs they have influenced and can take a lot of the credit for the Conservative government standing up to trans rights activists in its own party. We're now seeing a shift in, the, in Labour in the UK Parliament. The UK Labour leader Keir Starmer's decision not to oppose the Conservative government's blocking of the Scottish Bill is very significant. There now appears to be a distinct difference between Labour in the Senate and Labour in the UK Parliament. As we know, the Welsh Government is completely out of touch with the general public and nowhere is this more evident than in, than in the area of sport. Plaid Cymru member Shauna Williams, in reply to Hannah Glovin's statement, said, I also believe that trans women are women and that the way that trans women are being excluded by sporting body, bodies, whether you agree with it as a method of ensuring fairness or not, is emboldening those who are using sport as a cover for their, their transphobia and prejudice. She asked what conversations Hannah Bluthin had had with sports organisations and bodies in Wales about the ramifications of the decision taken by FINA, which is the governing body for swimming. In response, Hannah Bluthin confirmed that she and Senate member Dawn Bowden had had conversations already with sporting bodies. We know that Hannah Bluthin and Dawn Bowden have approached the Welsh Rugby Union to argue against their policy announced last September which says that contact rugby for players in the female category is limited to those whose sex was recorded as female at birth. Refreshingly, Megan Cumming was one of the groups which the WIU consulted, as were retired sports players, including Tonya. Hannah Bluthin also informed the Senate that she had invited Emily Bridges, a transgender cyclist, quote, to share her experiences. <coughs> How arrogant and out of touch are Hannah Bluthin and Dawn Bowden, and of course our First Minister, who in answer to a question from Lauren Jones about sports said, my starting point is that transgender women are women. He also said, I do not understand the point the member makes that you can be too inclusive. To me, inclusivity is absolutely what we should be aiming for. 
So no understanding of why we have separate categories in sport, including sex. He also had the cheek to say that in such a potentially divisive issue, the responsibility of elected representatives is not to stand on the certainties of their own convictions, but to look for opportunities for dialogue to find ways of promoting understanding rather than conflict and to demonstrate respect rather than to look for exclusion. This from the man who has never actually done this and has been confrontational and dismissive of gender critical women. I'd like now in this final section of my talk to concentrate on schools and children. Clearly, clearly there are incre these are incredibly important areas. Boris Johnson, when he was UK Prime Minister, stated that children in schools should not be taught anything that suggests they could be born in the wrong body. I've no doubt in England this is difficult to ensure, but in Wales we don't have any attempt at similar assurances. In fact, we have the reverse. From First Minister down, we have statements and policies which support the born in the wrong body narrative. If I can say a few words about the Hillary Cass interim review into gender identity services, I've already mentioned that Julie Morgan has not read it despite children falling under her, her remit. Laura Ann Jones question mark draped in the Senate about the review and in a fairly long exchange in answer to her questions, he started off by saying that the Cass review was commissioned by NHS England for NHS England. He said it is one source of evidence amongst others which can be drawn upon in developing services for trans children and young people in Wales. And he went on to say that the Welsh Health Specialist Services Committee met with Dr Cass in March and that they intend to ask for expressions of interest from those in the field for a gender identity development service for Wales and that that will be informed by the Cass review and conversations with her, but also by a broader set of evidence that we have here in Wales on the needs of young people in these circumstances, which will allow us not simply to pick up a set of solutions devised from a different jurisdiction, but to develop these services in a way that is sensitive to the landscape of services and the needs of young people here in Wales. I have to say that there are real concerns that Wales will not learn the lessons from the CAS review and will set up a service which makes some of the same mistakes as were identified in the CAS review, particularly the, review, the use of the affirmation model. The next area I'd like to look at is school toilets, and these have taken up a lot of our time in Mercury Cymru over the last few years. The law in Wales is quite clear that children in Wales over eight must be provided with separate sex toilets for boys and girls. It's astonishing to me that anyone would doubt the need for girls to have their own toilets, yet in Wales we have major problems. New schools are routinely built without dis designated single sex provision. Some schools think that, think that it's best practice to have mixed sex toilets, so we have schools deliberately changing their provision from single sex to mixed sex. We know that girls are avoiding using school toilets all day in school and if they don't have their own provision and we know that during menstruation girls are even more reluctant understandably to use mixed sex provision and we know that period shaming goes on. In Mecca Cymru we advise everyone who is a school governor, parent or grandparent to ask questions about toilet provision and make sure their school complies with the law. You would think it's obvious what single sex provision actually means, but you'd be wrong. Some schools have designated individual cubicles as male or female, but have communal wash basins. These are not separate sex in our view, and we don't believe this is what the law intended. What's worse is that we are often told that floor to ceiling doors prove that these toilets comply with the law. This is very worrying as floor to ceiling doors are a safeguarding risk. Usually it's left to individual schools to decide on toilet provision. This is certainly true in Cardiff. I'm chair of two primary school governing bodies. One of the schools is a new build and I've been able to make sure that we comply with the law. Similarly, plans for a new build of an old comprehensive in West Cardiff were altered by governors to include separate sex provision. This was very much driven by the high numbers of Muslim girls in the school. But having our own toilets surely is something all women and girls deserve. Incidentally, the UK government consulted on toilets and many of us responded. The result is that all public buildings are expected to have some single sex provision. This is not the case in Wales. So sticking to the toilet theme, let's talk about periods. The Welsh government has made itself a lacking, laughing stock here. They have a campaign called Bloody Brilliant. The original campaign material stated, we are bloody brilliant, a source of knowledge and support information and empowerment for young people who bleed across Wales. In response to criticism, this was changed to women, girls and people who have periods, which leaves us wondering who these people are. 
There is no acknowledgement that having periods is a uniquely female experience. Even in this latest version, girls are barely mentioned. Under my first period, it says a more immediate sign for some people is if you notice discharge in your pants. The resources talk about half the world's population experience period, experiencing periods, but don't say which half. Mecca Cymru was quoted extensively in Wales Online and said that supporters and members have told us that children are starting secondary school unclear about who has or doesn't have periods and anxious about expressing a view that, is a, that it is a female-only process. Even in the glossary, this is the definition of puberty. When a child's body begins to develop, including growing pubic hair, boobs starting to develop, growing taller and starting your period. I think our children deserve better than this. Welsh government tends to put out best practice policies to local authorities for use in schools. And amongst these, one which I find really concerning is the one on hate crime. I don't feel the whole idea of a crime policy for use in primary schools is appropriate. And the hate crime one, whilst not compulsory and possible to adapt for individual schools, is still deemed to be best practice. Its section on gender hate crime is, as you would expect, problematic and includes misgendering amongst its crimes. The policy has links to Stonewall and Mermaids. So to finish, I'll just say a few words about the RSC curriculum, that's sex relationships and sexuality education. And, and again, this has taken up considerable time and energy in Mecca Cymru. It's a really difficult area because most of the most vocal objections have come from fundamentalist religious groups and include objecting to correct names to correct names for body parts being mentioned and objections to new pictures of babies being used to illustrate the differences between boys and girls. These are not the objections Mecca Cymru would have. Our objections centre around the teaching of gender ideology as fact. Both groups, the religious ones and the gender critical groups, have highlighted the compulsory element of the RSE curriculum. And this is a difficult one. The religious groups basically don't want anything taught about sex and are often opposed to homosexuality. Gender critical groups like Mecca Cymru are coming from a different place. RSE is cross-curricular, so it's not simply a question of withdrawing children from a particular lesson. The RSE has ambiguous definitions of sex and conflates it with gender. The vocabulary is confusing. It uses terms like sex being assigned at birth. It doesn't address the impacts of biological sex, sex in the men stereotyping, and it doesn't acknowledge that sexual harassment is overwhelmingly male or female. It takes for granted that we all have a gender identity. Like the Bloody Brilliant campaign, there is little mention of boys or girls. A lot of responsibility is left to local authorities and individual schools. I know from my own experience that it is possible for a curriculum to be developed for an individual school, which is one that those of us who are gender critical can support. When one which is inclusive of all kinds of families, including same-sex ones, and which allows for girls to be taught separately from boys about menstruation and other female issues. But there are many obstacles and pitfalls, and we need to be particularly vigilant about outside bodies coming into schools, and this happens in two areas, in the training of teachers and in books, etc., which outside bodies offer to schools. There are two extreme agencies, Agenda and Crust, crush, which Welsh Government have removed from the recommended list, but Merced Cymru has evidence that they are still being used to train teachers, and there are other agencies being used by schools which totally present gender ideology as fact. Wales has consortia which offer training materials to schools. There is a free one called Great Relationships and Sex Education, which was sent by one of the consortia to 500 schools. In this document, gender ideology is presented as science. Uh, Mecca Cymru refers to missing pieces in the S spectrum. Sue, sorry, sorry, I'm going to have to... I've almost uh, finished. I just... The only thing is Heli has to go quite soon, so we need to... I, I, can you put the rest of it in the chat? Um, well, I'll or tell just you do what, one I'll... minute or 30 I'll, seconds, because Heli's I'll, I'll got to get minute, going. I'll do one minute, yeah. yeah. Mecca Cymru has a list of questions, and I, I won't, I won't go, go through I cancelled my appointment. It's okay, yeah. Sue. I cancelled my appointment. Okay. Thank you, Heli. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, they have, Sue, you they, could you could finish off because hell is. Okay. Yep. I'm sorry about that. It's, it's taking longer than when I read it through. It always doesn't it. Mecca Cymru refers to missing pieces in respect in regards to the RSE curriculum. 
one being the omission of the terms women, girls, boys, but also missing our pornography and violence directed at girls. And they have a list of questions for parents and governors and grandparents to ask. Does the school equality policies correctly list sex as one of the protected characteristics? Many of us have experienced of repeatedly having to correct these. Are the toilets single sex or gender neutral? How are external trainers checked and vetted? Are lessons biologically accurate and compliant with the Equality Act? What about safeguarding? Are materials porn positive? We know some of them are. Is there conflation of sex and gender? Does the school socially transition children without informing parents? Is teaching legal and accurate? We know that girls are shut down if they are gender critical. Does the school teach that there is not just one point of view? So some positive stories to finish with. Mecca Curry has just launched an amazing pocketbook for girls called A Best Friend's Handbook, and it's just for actual girls. A Best Friend's Handbook is written by Ali Morris and illustrated by Joe Vaughan. It covers topics such as relationships, sexual assault, coercion and harassment, grooming, bullying, domestic abuse, forced marriages, honour abuse, FGM, pornography, eating disorders, self-harm and more. It's aimed at 13 to 16 year olds and it's hoped to trial it in school in Wales. Look out for it if you're attending the Women's Place UK Educational or Women's Liberation Conference in London a week today. Other, other positive notes to end on. Some of us went out leafleting around shopping centres in Cardiff and Swansea over the Christmas period with Women's Rights Network leaflets. It was a reminder that public knowledge and support for our views is growing. More MPs and ex-MPs are speaking out every day and within the Senate there will be change. Mark Drakeford is stepping down as First Minister in the next year or so. We know that there are Senate members who are sympathetic but currently not speaking out. But there will be an election by Labour Party members using one member, one vote to elect a new First Minister. So we have the opportunity to try and get a First Minister who will support women and children. We're growing and we're organising and we're definitely making progress. Thank you, and apologies for going on so long. So, Heli is living in the Netherlands and has lived there for a long time, and she's the country contact for Women's Declaration International in the Netherlands and is going to give us an update on what's happening there. So thank you so much, Heli, and over to you. On the 20th of December uh, last year, one of the leading newspapers in the Netherlands published um, an article that was critical about gender ideology. Um, you have to understand that in the in main Dutch society, um, it's fairly accepted. So this says trans care must also comply with scientific and medical uh, standards. Um, underneath, it says that um, that the there's been an increase in the number of uh, people who want uh, trans care and uh and that they're treating children with uh, what is it um, puberty blockers um but there's been a, a change in meaning from the international community this article has been um quoted a number of times but it's really important to understand that it's it's really small step uh, one it subscribes throughout to the notion of true trans um, what it did reveal in the study is that the Dutch protocol was based on a study sponsored by the hormone producers, Fering. Um, it says that there are an increasing number of people in the Netherlands who are regretting subjecting themselves to irreversible treatment. And it accuses the, the clinics at the Amsterdam, the UMC, uh, University Medical Center, of accuse their clinicians of sticking their heads in the sand. Um, and it also links the rise in the number of diagnoses of gender dysphoria with the growth of social media and says that those, uh, that if you look at the two the, together, that it's a very similar graphic. Um, so number two, the authors, our signatories who wrote this are two uh, journalists, one is a researcher and a sociologist, um, and they are the authors of um, a, a manifesto, that's what they call it, which has been put together that's called Gender Doubt. Um, the one thing that I want to say about this uh, piece in the article, this article, 
that is the most important is that it's not a mainstream journalist. No, the slides are not in English, sorry, um, but I'm doing a translation. <laughs> um, the, these, this piece and pretty much all of the pieces that have been um, um, critical are um, opinion pieces. So this one is one that's actually called Opinion and Debate. Um, and that's about the only places that they appear. So uh, on the website of the NRC, uh, there, was, um, there was a link uh, on this article to another article, which was a response to this one, which was titled, Be Careful with Gender Care. It was written by the people who this article were criticizing. So this one says, be careful with gender care. And it says underneath, more research is needed, but the Dutch protocol has proven its worth. Um, in this study, the only uh, links that they put in were to research that they'd done themselves. Um, the kind of articles that tend to be published in the news in the Netherlands are very, very different. So you've got things like this. So this says, I'm a woman, but uh, keeping my transition quiet is apparently not done. In this article, the man who's called Christine says that in the 1980s, when he transitioned, lesbians wanted to have sex with him. So that's, you know, and, and it's all of this very, very, subtle, um, uh, 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 what do you call it, indoctrination, you know? Um, so this is actually a news item, it's an interview, but, uh, it, you know, and anything that's against the ideology is just somebody's opinion. I have to say that as the, the WDI representative for the Netherlands, I feel in general very isolated, and I think most of us country contacts do, and, and one of our main contacts is with other like-minded women is through and because of uh, the Women's Declaration International. Um, and here in the Netherlands, the only vocal, what I would say, sex integrity insistent women that I've come into contact with are also foreigners. Most Dutch women seem to feel that feminism has already achieved its, all its aims and is no longer necessary. Uh, and when you talk to them, they want to be nice and they want to be kind and they don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, especially not men's. Um, what's really interesting is that the subheading on this says, uh, I became a woman decades ago um, and that that was accepted now, but uh, that has now changed um, in the last few years. And he says, uh, I don't want to have to introduce myself as transgender. I want to continue to introduce myself as a woman. Um, funnily enough, just as I was getting ready to do this, our uh, newspaper came in, we get one every weekend, and there was another article published today, again in the NRC, and this one, um, which makes my partner, who's a scientist, rage, was in the science section. So this says, um, uh, teenagers or puberty uh, with a pause. There is so much misinformation in this article, pictures this really ungirl liking boy. He believes he's a girl, he's on puberty blockers. There's interviews with him. And again, the article is written by the same team from the Am Amsterdam uh, University Medical Center who treats this person. So um, the article says, that puberty blockers are fully reversible. Um, he also says that uh, as he's attracted to men, so it's another gay, it's another child who's had the gay trans out of him, you know, um, what it says is that, yeah, because he's attracted to men, then it doesn't matter that he doesn't, and he doesn't want children. Um, there's a key point in this. So that's the same thing, but where you see it squared, um, what this says is that uh, the University of Amsterdam has received 800,000 euros to research 2,000 children who they have treated um, in the last 30 years. Uh, and in this point, uh, so, and it's to do, and the 800,000 euro funding is to do 
uh, scientific and medical research into the amount of time, what's happened over that time and how many people they can get in touch with and stuff. Now, bear in mind that the original Dutch protocol, even though they dealt with thousands, well, I think they dealt with about 3000 um, people at that time, the actual study that they based what they do on was based on around 50 people. They got in touch with about, what was it? 120, I think it was who had been through, but they chose the people who they got in contact with. Over a third of the people did not answer their questions. And so the number of 99 and 98% people who were happy with their transition is based on 50 people who they chose. Yeah? And a third of them, yeah, so if it was a third, what's that like? So it was 80 people or 75, something like that. Yes, yeah, something. 75, isn't it, if it's a third, yeah, who, who just didn't even bother answering them. And, um, you know, when people stop uh, transitioning, they usually uh, do so with a lot of anger and rage, and they don't get in, in contact with the people who, who've done that to them. Um, and so they already know that. So the whole protocol is flawed, which is why they've put up this money. And the journalist asks during this interview, he says, so, if you've got 800,000 euros to do medical and scientific research, does that mean that up until this point, there's been a group of people who have been treated without a clear scientific basis, right? That's stated in here. The answer is we always do a thorough diagnosis with a multidisciplinary disciplinary team. So they totally glide past the question and it's the journalist and not one of the other person and not one of the people being interviewed who says that uh, other science, psychiatric problems can exist <clears throat> in people with gender dysphoria and they need to have a supportive family. Underneath this paragraph, right exactly where the bottom red line goes, is the start of the next paragraph. So having asked that question in the first one, in the next paragraph, the heading of the paragraph is, worries are unfounded. So, it is important to state that dis despite this almost to total or seeming total support for the ideology in the newspapers, um, mm. on the television, like, you know, um, one of the um, most famous um, comedians did a skit in which people who were asking the questions that we ask, uh, were um, labeled as uh, egocentric, arrogant, ignorant boomers. Um, what came as a massive surprise was that when it came to the passing of the self-ID law, so there's this uh, group who the two men um, are, the two authors from the, um, of the article are part of this manifesto, as I said, now the manifesto was set up by a group who were called Gender Doubt. And they got together with you know, the usual collection of religious people and right wingers to do um, a poster campaign throughout the Netherlands. So people who were on um, Twitter, um, Instagram may have seen that this campaign, that this poster that they did out, yeah, this poster is the bit in the middle was defaced all over there was a, like there were literally busloads of people young people going from amsterdam all around the country to deface this poster uh in bus stops and on the walls and what it said well it says up there the new transgender law affects everyone so on the basis of this they um hang on a minute yeah so it says so they created a manifesto um, and uh, in, the, in the manifesto are well, the reasons why gender ideology, when they say gender ideology, they mean the law is opposed, um, are laid out in the manifesto. And number one is the rights of women. Number two is its lack of a scientific basis. Number three is that the way that it is proposed and the way that it is, um, uh, that you can't speak out against people. So if you if you are at all critical, you're accused of being hateful. So they say that the way that it's uh, uh, presented is a threat to democracy. They also say that the um, that the basic 
uh, um, parameters are antithetical to religion. And of course, in the Netherlands, everybody has the right to, to worship as they want. And they just say that the whole way that it's uh, uh, premised and the way that it's spoken about uh, means that it's ex exclusionary to religions. And the number five, the way that it's being implemented undermines parenting. Um, the manifesto has been signed by um, officially 40 individuals. And I think that's because, you know, officially on the website, there's just 40, but I think they've all paid and they all pay and contribute to have that there and to support it in some way. But one of the people who signed it, there's a few, there's one guy who just describes himself as a father of two, but there's a lot of people from organizations on there. And I think the one to, to know is uh, Caroline, who was the former uh, WDI country, con country contact in the Netherlands and uh, the founder of a, of a charity, Stichting Charity, for Zai, for she or for her. Um, you might have heard about them because they've had their money accounts blocked for their women's rights activists activism and Caroline has to all extents and purposes dropped out of public life because she just came out very openly as being gender critical assuming <laughs> that that would be fine and of course has got the usual round of death threats and um and shit so she's kind of a bit more in the background but still working with her organization um so when uh so this this campaign was started in about this time last year to give it time for up until september it was everybody thought these posters they kept saying they're transphobic and they're hateful and you mustn't take any notice of them but by the time it came to um the the trader camera which is like the parliament in um september we were there were a lot of uh there was a concerted an extremely well thought out political backlash to the ideology. Um, and uh, one of the, the best uh, kind of speeches was presented by a young, he's like in his thirties and he's originally Afghani. He was a, um, a uh, what do you call it, an, um, a refugee. Um, and he framed it in terms of uh, the, the care that you have to have for an individual. Um, and so, of course, most of the women framed it in terms of women's dangers and, you know, all of the stuff that's happened. And that was poo-pooed and shouted down as being hateful. And his presentation was all about how these are very young, vulnerable people. And um, isn't it asking too much of them to make such a huge life-changing decision at such a young age on their own without the support and guidance of a professional? Um, and that, that, that he felt that that was um, irresponsible. And anyway, the, there was such a huge discussion. They'd allowed four hours for it. It went on for 16 and then started again the next day and they closed the next day early and they took it off the table. And today we know nothing. Yeah, but they, their money was also canceled from uh, PayPal and other places. It wasn't only bunk that they were stopped from, from sending money to. It's literally, you know, like even her bank accounts have been threatened. Um, anyway, so up to date, we don't know when the law is gonna be proposed again. And um, we're assuming, everybody's assuming that um, the, the pro uh, people are lobbying with the other because of course the whole left is captured but the, the, there's a lot of lobbying going on at the moment and we assume that when they think they can push it through they will give a really quick announcement and put it into parliament to try and push it through so we just have to be really really vigilant at the moment in the meantime it seems like there's more one-to-one -one conversations taking place um so I, I think here also there is a wave of feeling that, you know, the tide is turning, the tide is turning. That was it. So Jill Raymond is an uh, active member of UK WDI Women's Declaration International. She wrote a letter uh, explaining the concerns about for lesbian rights to 
many parliamentarians, maybe all of them in the UK, and then was invited to come and explain those issues and bring along some other lesbians to the House of uh, the, the House of Lords, well, by a lord, but or a, a baroness, um, and uh, and had a meeting a couple of weeks ago, which seemed to go quite well. So Jill's going to tell us about that. And thank you very much for coming, Jill, and over to you. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, yes, in, indeed, because um, as, as Sue had given us a, a, a good summary of what's been going on in Scotland, and a lot of us have been following that across um, the UK, uh, particularly through WDI updates from Sally. Um, and uh, so uh, there were quite a lot of letter writing campaigns around it being get, go, coming to the um, UK Parliament for um, royal assent. And um, I've also been listening to um, a lot of lesbians speaking on our webinars and in the breakout room about how we've been losing our lesbian spaces, what's happening to lesbians online. Um, and, you know, it's it, the two things sort of conflated. So um, I wrote a letter um, just with a with the call. I called it a lesbian perspective on the um, uh, impact of the Gender Recognition Reform Bill, Scotland. Um, and, um, you know, you write these letters, you just get a stock reply. Um, and I never expected that a week later, I'd be in the House of Lords with a bunch of lesbians. So, uh, but what I did was I took it to our, our regular UK um, WDI meeting. And I said, look, I've written this, but it could go from me, but it could go from all of us. So we, we, they quickly agreed it, and it was very brief and to the point. And uh, so um, it went the next morning um, and landed on the um, inbox of Baroness Nicholson. One of the women had suggested we particularly wrote to her because she's got um, a long, she's 80 years old and she's got a long record of being um, quite a, a feminist and a very a big supporter of women's rights. So. Um, so we were immediately invited, like by midday, to um, to to meet her, and uh, the week that the um, royal assent was due, and there was a little bit of like, mm, well, it's obviously going to not get passed in the UK. The, the royal assent is not looking like it's going to be granted, but as she she had a lot of emails from her and she said you know it just just because it's looking like it's not going to go through on thursday doesn't mean the thing is over you know we're in this for the long haul so i hope you'll still come and, and meet us so so um so then she had to book a, a committee room um and uh, you know i mean the emails were coming thick and fast she managed to get a committee room that would hold 40 people so she said, you know, we've got a big room. I could, it's the only one I could get. We can't unfortunately do Zoom from it, or but um, try and try and fill it up. Try and fill it up. And I will invite my friends too, which we weren't too sure what that meant. Well, I don't think most of them, I wasn't. So um, in the end, um, we we um, she only wanted lesbian uh, speakers and lesbian guests. Uh, so we managed to find through through our immediate WDI contacts, really, we got um, six women to speak. Um, Joe obviously was there to introduce the WDI as an international global networking. And um, then um, so we got about 20 guests to manage to turn up at five o'clock on a mid, you know, on a midday week. It was it proved very hard. To, well, it was impossible to find any young lesbians that would a be available and b want to risk that level of um, exposure because it was like they would be coming out by attending that meeting. Um, and and actually, that's really highlighted for me how much responsibility us as elders have to um, interject into the younger generations of of lesbians. Um, so we've got, you know, most of us have got a lot less to lose. We're, we're not necessarily in work, for example. Um, so um, Bernadette and I were invited to have tea with her an hour before the meeting, which also wasn't very expected, but it did help us put us at ease. And um, another thing that I just sort of mention is that she's quite... 
Baroness is quite hard of hearing, so she does lip read. So um, that was that was a sort of a consideration. I felt that was a consideration, but it was all being recorded. Um, and when we got into the room, it was full. They, um, she, her, her guests. We had been given a guest list, and her guests were cross-party parliamentarians from um, House of Commons and the House of Lords. Uh, I think we can safely say that they weren't all on our side, but uh, some of them sent their aides because it was at the very time that the um, they uh, it was all going off in the House of Commons with Moyles uh, and the um, uh, the unpleasantness um, in the with the Labour within the Labour ranks, you know. So um, so anyway, we we had um, six speakers and then. And then um, she threw, she took on the chair and uh, chairing and opened it to her parliamentary guests to ask our broader guests um, some questions. And um, one of the things that was really nice was Joanna Cherry had come and she spoke about how touched and overwhelmed she was to be sitting in, uh, in that room with full of lesbians. Oh yeah, there's that lovely picture of us at the end. Um, she uh, she had um, Baroness Nicholson had invited her niece to sit in to listen. So her niece took the photograph um, for us. So um, yeah, so that's uh, we, we were all like, oh, we we were only there an hour. And another thing that happened was that her parliamentarians were coming and going. You can see one in that picture just about to leave. Every time one arrived she stopped the meeting to introduce them and welcome them and get a seat for them. Um, so it, this, this actually sort of nipped quite a bit of the time that we had. So we didn't have a lot of time at the end for, for questions and answers, um, but um, it was, it was we, I, we, I felt, we felt very sort of, we felt very welcomed and that it was a great response basically. Um, and then, um, one of the one of the things that I'd really hoped um, was that WDI would be in, would impress her enough, and that she would like us enough that we would be able to become an organisation for ongoing consultation. And one of the things that has become really apparent over this, or a lot of the legal legal the laws around um, self ID are that no no women's organizations have been consulted and so we we actually i think it also works for wdi that we're not politically aligned in the house of lords they um they do a lot more cross party work for uh, more um non uk listeners um but the the house of lords they're not elected so our house of commons are elected but uh, they, there's a lot of scrutiny uh, and cross-party work goes on in the House of Lord. I think I've explained that reasonably well. So, um, so yeah, so we were delighted at the end of the meeting, she, with all the thanks was going on, and she said, I'm, you know, I'm just, I, I'm just so, I'm so interested. Some of the speakers were really moving. You could see some of the, the, the um, parliamentarians looked a bit shocked at some of the statements that our speakers were making. And she said, I I'm, I'm, hope that we, you will be able to come back again. You'll be very welcome to come back again, which was just like the icing on the cake, really, wasn't it? So um, so, so or she's also a very big tweeter. So be, be, before, I think before almost before we'd got to the pub to sort of celebrate a little bit, we had a little wander around the, the par Houses of Parliament and stopped off for this photo opportunity in the Great Hall, Bernadette. She wants us to bring a, a delegation of speakers, um, not, not specifically or only lesbian, but other a, a broader uh, range of speakers about to talk about the um, conversion therapy bill and uh, and put potential amendments. So, um, so we, we've got a, a card working team, um, a core group working on this. And I, and I, I have to say a bit like with Vicky really, we, we've got to know each other and, and supported each other in, in, in an un, un, unexpected way. But we've been attending webinars and breakout rooms. We've got to know each other. On Monday nights, we meet. And, and this, has made, this has made it 
pos that made it possible for us to, to form a, a core group to work closely and really, really efficiently um, and, and harmoniously to get this done in in um, in, in a week. Um, and um, so, yes, thank you, WDI. Thank you, all our supporters. And, and full steam ahead.